Around midnight on Sunday the 1st of November, a couple in their 60s and a seven-year-old child died in a house fire in Northampton. Someone squirted petrol into the front hall of their home. Now, there's no known motive and it might well be that their deaths were unintentional. And if so, detectives hope that when the arsonist sees this disturbing reenactment of what resulted from their action, he, she or they just might come forward voluntarily. Our reconstruction begins on the Thorplands estate in Northampton, just after 10.30 p.m. Hey, you little minx, get in that bed. Oh, now, no more nonsense, or Cyril will be after you. Sarah. Hey, Cyril, do you want a cup of coffee, love? Yes, please, love. Stacy lived with her grandmother, Florence Pennell. Florence, known as Penny, was popular, lively and outspoken, a matriarchal figure with seven grown-up children. Two years ago, she'd become engaged to Cyril Fensom, a former plumber, and they seemed very happy. That Sunday, by midnight, their home was all in darkness and all three were sound asleep. On the other side of Northampton, at Rubicon Casino, Penny's son Christopher, a regular there, was leaving after a successful night. He'd won over 400 pounds. He picked up a curry on his way home at Wellingborough Road. Just don't tell me you're full in your face again. I'll leave off, Iris. I haven't eaten all day. Mum's been babysitting. How are you doing? Just going to end the taxes? Yeah, I'm going to get my own car and get it plated now, though. Have you got a car? Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll see you later. Thank right. you. Thanks. Good night, sir. Thank you. Chris lived with his mother, and having bought some coke and cigarettes, he headed home. The midnight news, this is Clive Bull. It was after midnight when he pulled into South Holm Court. He sat in the car for a moment, listening to the local midnight news. And the weather forecast, cloudy overnight. Everything is here. On the first floor, Christopher was watching BBC You're Two, a war film called Castle Keep. <laughs> Upstairs, Cyril, Penny and Stacy were asleep. Fifty yards away, this woman, a neighbour, had bumped her car and got out to check the damage. A man had come from the direction of South Holm Court. She remembers there were red slats on the back of his Renault Fuego. The car drove off towards Lumber Tubs Way dual carriageway. Castle Keep ended at 12.30, and as it did so, Christopher smelt something like burning rubber. <coughs> His first thought was to dial 999, but the phone wires were burnt through. The acrid smoke began to choke him as he tried to warn the family. South Home Court. Mum! Stacy! Cyril! Come on, Chris. Someone started a fire! Mum! Go round the back! People in there! Where about Sada? On the top floor! Penny had jumped from the second floor window. Can you tell us where she, what happened? She just jumped. Jumped from where? The top. On the top. 
At first, Farman thought Stacy was asleep, but she'd inhaled fumes from burning furniture. Stacy died four days later. Penny died that evening of internal injuries. Cyril was dead by the time he arrived at hospital. Mr. Pritchett, what do you hope that showing that reconstruction will achieve? You've shown some terrible scenes there. It may be that the person involved in this didn't intend these murders. However, the longer the matter goes undetected, the less likely it's going to be that such an explanation is likely to be believed. I'm hoping that whoever it is, once he's seen these things, will come forward and tell us, or anybody that knows of this person will ring us and let us know who that person may be. The man who was seen by the witness leaving the scene, I gather you now know that he was unconnected with the fire, almost certainly. He was just a passerby. That's right. Scientists have told us that he was at the scene some time prior to the fire being started. However, he is the only man that we haven't yet been able to trace from those people that we know were about at the time. Well, there he is in a red-style uh, jacket. Uh, it's, he's six foot uh, tall in his, in his early 30s. She was able to give you a fairly good description of him, I gather. That's right, a very good description. This man may have been visiting someone in the area for quite a sensitive reason, perhaps seeing a lady friend. If that man or the person he was seeing recognises themselves, I urge them, please come forward and tell us, because we do need to sort this matter out and eliminate this man. How much confidence will be respected if he was, as you put it, seeing a lady friend? If that is the situation, I can assure that man total anonymity and total confidence. I shall now embarrass him, if I may, because we've got to find him uh, by revealing more about the car, the red uh, Fuego. It actually had red slats on the back, I gather, that are, that are quite unusual. That's right. The manufacturers only make them in black plastic. So the painting on the slats would have been done either by the current or a previous owner. So right. if anybody does know of a red fuego with red coloured slats on the back, I need to find out who that person is. Mr Bridget, it might seem superfluous under the circumstances, but someone's offered a reward, I gather. That's right. A local Northamptonshire businessman has offered £5,000 reward for any information leading to the detection of this crime. OK. Well, please do call us. If there's any way you think you can help... Remember, you can call us in confidence and you can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. The number is 01811 8055. There it is. Or you can call the Northampton Incident Room. That's 0604, the code, 703572. 0604, the code for Northampton, 703572. Well, as we've said so often on this programme, it's a fact that the least likely people to become the victims of a crime are the elderly. Few criminals sink that low. And that's one of the reasons that when it does happen, it's a matter of particular urgency that someone who's attacked an old person is found. Our next case tonight is the murder of an 84-year-old lady in Devon, Miss Ivy Batten. Police don't yet know for sure, but the motive was probably robbery. Somebody hoped she had cash or something else worth stealing at home. Our reconstruction begins near Honiton in East Devon, where Ivy Batten had lived all her life. The hamlet of Shute Bottom lies right on the main Waterloo to Exeter railway line, deep in the Devon countryside. Ivy Batten moved here to this bungalow overlooking the railway line with her brother 22 years ago. When her brother died in 1979, she stayed on alone. Ivy had spent all her life in the area. She came from a large family and was very well known and much respected. She had numerous nephews and nieces. Come on, Janet, you've been out there long enough. I've made the tea, so come and have a cup. Well, it hasn't taken you as long as I thought, actually. Her great-niece, Janet, was a regular visitor. On Wednesday, the 25th of November, Janet had stopped by to see Ivy, who'd been unwell with a chill. Have you done any Christmas shopping yet? No, I haven't even started, oh, oh, oh. Anthony. I haven't even bought my Christmas cards yet. Oh, I've started to do my cards now. Oh, yeah. oh that reminds me. I picked you up your stamps and a couple of chicken pieces. Oh, thank you, dear. 
Oh, they look lovely. I should put one in the casserole and the other one can go in the freezer for now. But that's why I got you two portions, because I thought that you would want to do that. Well, thanks, dear, for what you've done today. Oh, that's all right, Auntie. But listen, take care of that chill, OK? And I'll pop back and see you on Sunday. Right. Right, Ella. Bye, Thank then. you. Bye. Bye. Morning, Postman. I was Good hoping morning. I'd see you. Got two letters. Right, here. lovely. One for oh, you. Oh, thank you very much. Your paper's here a minute. Thank you. Not a very nice day, is no, it? No, it isn't. Bye now. Bye. Ivy spent most of Thursday working on her nativity basket. She'd made one every Christmas for years. She was known by many of the train drivers who regularly passed her home. And at 4.13, a driver remembers seeing her waving to him from her kitchen window. At 20 past five, a neighbor passing the bungalow saw the place in darkness. But at 6.30, another train driver remembers the kitchen light was on, but there was no sign of Ivy. An hour later, at 7.30 p.m., her great nephew, Frank, a farmer, drove by, having finished the evening milking. He noticed the front gate was ajar. Nine o'clock next morning, Janet and her friend Ruth took her dog for his usual walk. Seeing the closed curtains, Janet assumed her aunt was having a lie-in because of her chill. Next morning, Saturday, all the deliveries arrived as usual. Then Janet and two friends saw the curtains still drawn and became really concerned. Janet found her aunt's body on the sitting room floor. She'd been beaten about the head and had died from her injuries sometime after the attack on the Thursday evening. When the police searched the bungalow for forensic evidence, they found that the electricity had been turned off at the mains. When the power was restored, three lights and the TV came on. A week later, in a field 800 yards away, two farm workers found a pair of well-worn purple and gold gloves and a hammer. Forensic tests have confirmed that these were used by Ivy Batten's murderer. Well, in charge of the case is Detective Superintendent John Essery. We'll start with the gloves and the hammer which we've brought into the studio here. In fact, looking at them more closely, I would have said these gloves were not so much purple and gold as purple and brown or khaki or mustardy coloured. Well, that's true, but they're very, very distinctive. They're, they're predominantly purple, but they've got this gold band. And in fact, the band on the right hand is much larger than that on the left hand. They're also distinctive in that both thumbs are worn. And so if you look closely, you can see that they've both been repaired, both thumbs have been repaired, probably at independent times, because this one, the left, is with blue thread and the right with the dark thread. So whoever used these gloves probably did some kind of manual work that, that made him wear at the thumbs. That is a possibility that it was uh, wear. It's equally possible that uh, they might have wanted freedom for the thumb in their trade or profession. Now these aren't bought in a shop, they've been knitted by somebody who might be, rec might be watching now and might recognise them. That's true, they're hand knitted, they've been hand repaired. The person that knitted them would recognise them, the person that repaired them would recognise them. And so too would somebody working or living alongside 
the offender. Let's hope they would. Now, the hammer is also particularly distinctive. It's not an ordinary domestic household hammer, is it? It's an unusual one. No, it's not. We all own hammers, and probably we can recognise our own hammers, but this one is very distinctive. It's what is called a blocking hammer or a planishing hammer. It's used in a variety of trades. It's used at technical schools. Uh, it's used in metalwork. It's used in uh, precious metalwork. And it has been used, probably innocently, in its uh, use in hitting a surface harder than its own, which isn't to be found in the household. And from our inquiries, we know that that hammer was made between April 74 and the 31st of December 76. We can see it's split here. That makes it even more distinctive. Yes, I think that uh, the person that's used that hammer, the innocent person that's used that hammer, will recognise it. They'll recognise it by the crack on it. And I'm sure that if any viewer thinks that they've got a hammer like that, then I would ask them to go and have a look and see if they've still got it in their toolbox. Right. It may have been stolen from them. Let's hope so. One particularly important clue also is that there was a car seen just a few yards from the bridge, very near Ivy's home. What about that? Yes, that car is uh, facing in the shoot direction, just a few yards from Ivy. Uh, it's variously described. Uh, we think that it's possibly a white Viva with a black roof, but it could also possibly be uh, a Cortina. It's been de described by three witnesses, and that one was there in the evening between 18.30, that's 6.30, and 7.30 on Thursday the 26th. Right, finally, this person may be and If so, do you think somebody might be sheltering them? We've given the gloves and the hammer very wide coverage in, in uh, the southwest. Nobody's come forward. It is possible that somebody's shielding them. To, to that person, I would say this. The person that committed this offence was probably a burglar. He may burgle again. And if he does, and if he's cornered, will he murder again? And if the answer to that is yes, then my message to the person that's shielding him is simply, could you live with your conscience? Mr. Essery, thank you. And please help if you can, particularly if you know anything about those gloves or the hammer or the car. The number to ring here in the studio is 01 811 or you can dial Devon and Cornwall Incident Room Direct. It's 0392 3991. That's 0392, the code for Exeter, 3991. Well, now the first of those reconstructions. Three weeks ago, Debbie Lindsley was murdered in broad daylight on a suburban train journey to Victoria that took only 31 minutes. It was a case that made national headlines. Debbie was 26 years old and worked as a hotel receptionist in Edinburgh. She'd been visiting her parents to prepare for the wedding of her brother, Gordon. Both he and her mother helped us by taking part in this reconstruction of the events on the day of the murder. Debbie was looking very very much forward to her brother's wedding. She was very excited about it. She was looking forward to being a bridesmaid. When she went for a fitting at the beginning of March with the other two bridesmaids, she looked lovely in it. Debbie was staying with her family for three days after a hotel management course in London. It was a happy time for her. There was the wedding to look forward to, and the day she was leaving home, she had a rather special date in London, en route back to her job in Edinburgh. She'd been on this course from her hotel. Somebody there, you know, offered her a job, so she thought she would go and have a look around the hotel just to see what it was like. So on that morning, she got herself dressed up nicely, and she was going to have a look around. She had a few hours to spare. At lunchtime on the 23rd of March, she watched Neighbours. Look, do we have to watch this rubbish? Oh, shut up, scumbag. It's nearly over. Me? Look, if you want to lift to the station, we'll have to make a move soon. Oh, all right, then. Debbie was security conscious. She carried a rape whistle on her keyring. At about two o'clock, Gordon dropped her off at Petswood Railway Station. It's on the Orpington to Victoria line. There are no more sightings of her after this. Police know she bought a ticket at 2.04. Her train arrived at 2.18. She would always be aware of the dangers when she was traveling. Even with me, you know, we would always go into an open carriage rather than a closed one. She knew the dangers of that.
But Debbie was a smoker, and on this train, one of the few smoking areas was a single compartment, so she got in. It was at the front of the second carriage. She may have seen other female passengers in it, which made her feel safe, but at some point, they may have got out. Police believe she smoked at least one cigarette and almost certainly she started eating one of her sandwiches. At any rate, there's nothing to suggest that she was disturbed for the first part of her journey. Penge East is five stops from Victoria. The train arrived on time at 2.34. A witness remembers seeing a man hurriedly changing carriages. Another incident occurred after the train left Brixton. A French girl in the compartment next to Debbie's heard screams that lasted for about two minutes. She told the police she'd wanted to pull the communication cord, but was too shocked to move. When the train arrived at Victoria, the girl spotted a man with red hair walking away from near Debbie's compartment. She followed him. Eventually, she lost sight of him on the concourse. Meanwhile, the train was being checked for left luggage. Debbie had been savagely stabbed to death. There was no apparent motive for the attack. The ticket collectors at Victoria say 30 to 40 people got off that train, but so far only 26 have been accounted for. Police have now established that Debbie's attacker was injured in the struggle. A man with a cut face was seen walking away from platform two about 10 minutes after the train had pulled in. A little later that afternoon in the gents toilets at Victoria, another witness spotted a man cleaning a cut on his head. Thousands of people passed through Victoria Station that Wednesday afternoon. They could have been traveling to anywhere in the country or even abroad. Any one of them might help identify Debbie's murderer. Well, the officer in charge of the case is Detective Superintendent Alec Edwards. Now, can you just point out, we've got a model here of the train, where, where exactly did Debbie get on? Yes, this is the front of the train, this is the second compartment, and this is the compartment that Debbie actually got into. Mm. Surprisingly, we haven't any witness who saw Debbie alive from the time she was dropped off by her brother until she was found dead some 30 minutes later. And yet she was wearing very striking clothes, wasn't she? Yes, she, she? was. She's a good-looking girl. She was dressed in a blue jumper, blue skirt, very much like the colour you have on today. Right and with a black leather jacket over the top. So you want anybody who saw her from that point? Very much so. Right. Well, let's move on to the man at Penge Station, seen changing, changing carriages. What about him? You have a description of him, don't you? Yes, I have. He's aged 30 years, stocky build, dirty blonde hair, scruffy, pale brown jacket. We urgently need to trace that person to eliminate him from the inquiry. So he may not necessarily be the person no, you're looking for. No, not at all. No, right. he may have other information for us. Now, then we go on to Victoria Station, where there are three different sightings. The first one by the French girl, who heard the awful screams. And uh, do you have a description of the man she followed? Yes. He's aged about 40, well-built, muscular rather than fat, reddish-brown hair, moustache, which follow the contour of his lips, light windsheet and grey trousers. And what about the, the second sighting? Now, that's not the same description, the man with the scratch. No, it's not the same sighting, and we do not think they are connected. 
but we would urgently wish to eliminate both men from the inquiry. But would anybody come forward if they had a scratch and they were seen on that Possibly. On that day, on that day we had uh, an international football match at Wembley Stadium between England and Holland. We know that there were scuffles in the area. It may well have been he was involved in one of those scuffles and is just an innocent passerby. What about the murder weapon? It's described as possibly a good quality kitchen knife. And that suggests that perhaps it was premeditated? Yes, it's unlikely that anybody would find that in a carriage. That person had it with him when he left his home that day. And finally, the one thing that's emerged is that there's probably a lot more people on that train who, who you haven't actually interviewed yet. Yes, we've analysed the witnesses' statements. Now, we now believe that there are possibly up to 20 other persons we need to trace. They must um, come forward, mustn't they? Yes, we need the assistance of anyone who can help in this inquiry. What about this motiveless murder? I mean, it was an awful story and it hit all the headlines. A lot of people have been upset by it. Yeah. A very savage attack, mm. uh, made more disturbing by the fact that it was in the middle of the day in such a public place. We need to catch that person. And an incentive, possibly over £35,000 reward, 30000 reward for that, of any information. Here's the number if you want to call, 01 811 Or if you prefer, here's the direct line to the murder incident room, 01434 5175. That's 01434 5175. Six weeks ago... The body of a young woman was found by a farmer in County Antrim. She was Inga Hauser, an 18-year-old student who travelled to Britain from Munich using an interrail pass. That's a ticket to travel on virtually any train in Europe. Judging from the diary that was found among her belongings, she thoroughly enjoyed herself. But somehow things went wrong. Can you help tell us how and where? Our reconstruction begins just after she'd arrived in London at Easter time. Saturday, 2nd of April. Dear Mum and Dad, you dears, you probably could not imagine how much I like England. I would preferably stay a year longer. I am totally entranced by London. And you don't need to worry about me, for the people here are so lovable and so ready to help that I'm quite sure I shall never be short of money. See you soon. Happy Easter. Your Inge Maria. During her trip, Inga kept notes in her diaries and she wrote several postcards to friends and relatives. Oxford, this is Oxford. Train at platform two is the 1346 to Banbury, Leamington Spa, Coventry. Monday, 4th of April. Went to Oxford. Stayed at the youth hostel. Ate too much. Decided to go to Bath. Inga phoned home regularly. She also took snapshots of the places she visited. Tuesday, 5th of April. Going to Liverpool now. Took a short walk through Liverpool Station region. Went on to Preston and from there to Inverness. Slept in the train. Dear Gabi, dear Christian, dear Martina, morning has broken in Scotland. Breakfast in Inverness. Nice town. Have to see the Loch Ness Monster one day. There are no more postcards after this, and this is her last photograph. But her diaries go on. My journey has run without hitch so far and it is really indescribably lovely. Unfortunately, my money is slowly running out. Inga drew this sketch of someone on a train. Do you know who it is? Going to Glasgow now. Snowy mountains, wild landscape. Went from Glasgow to Ayr and from there to Stranra to get over to Ireland. Saw the sea, beautiful and mysterious. Wonder where I stay tonight. Need more money. That was the last entry in her diary. Thank you. 
These two passengers were boarding the ferry when they almost bumped into Inga. They remember following her onto the boat. Later, one of them saw Inga cross the lounge. But she was without her rucksack. Where was it? Had she left it with someone else? A few minutes afterwards, Inga was seen on deck. Again, she didn't have her rucksack. This was the last positive sighting that police have of Inga. The ferry, the Galloway Princess, docked at Larne shortly after 9.30 that evening. But the witnesses say Inga was not among the foot passengers who caught the train to Belfast. Were you on that train? If so, did you see Inga? More than a hundred vehicles were on the ferry that night. So did someone give Inga a lift? And if so, who? And where did they go? Inga could have traveled anywhere in Ireland. For two weeks, she disappeared. But up the coast from Larne, near Bally Castle, a woman like Inga was seen. Several people have told police that a girl was hitchhiking in the North Antrim area on Sunday the 17th of April. If it wasn't Inga, do you know who it was? At the northeast tip of County Antrim is Ballypatrick Forest. And here, in a remote corner over a mile from the main road, a farmer was searching for his sheep. He'd spotted something in a small clearing and went back to have a look. Inga had been dead for several days. She had severe head injuries, but no motive has been established for her murder. On the Sunday, three days before Inga's body was found, two local people noticed a red car pull out behind them. It was travelling away from the point where Inga was later found. A man and a woman were in the car. The vehicle went down a no-through road. Who was in the car and what were they doing in the forest? Above all, where had Inga been for the fortnight since she left the ferry on the 6th of April till her body was discovered among the trees? Mr Kasky, we're talking about events that happened after Easter and the two weeks immediately after that. That's a long time ago. Now, if anybody had seen Inga, why would they remember her? Uh, she was a friendly and outgoing young girl and uh, made friends easily. Uh, she liked England and uh, the English people and took delight in telling people about this. If anyone uh, met her in her travels throughout England and Scotland and she struck up conversation about this, uh, we would be very pleased to hear from them, particularly if she imparted to them uh, her plans uh, when she was going to Ireland. Now the key does seem to be what happened at Larne, because that's where her letters home stop, that's when her phone calls stop, that's when the diary stops a missing, a blank two weeks. So people on that boat presumably must hold the key to it. Yes, I, I would make an appeal to the people on the boat. Uh, anyone who made the crossing that night, who saw Inga, was she in anyone's company? Uh, did they see her leave the boat? And again, was she in anyone's company? Uh, or was she seen leaving Larne? And if so, by what means? The motive. I know you don't know what it is, but you must have quite strong suspicions. What are they? I believe the motive uh, to be sexual, but I do believe that Inga did fight for her honour and uh, she died as a result of putting up a fight. Well, there must be people watching who have some idea of where Inga was, what she was doing, or think they saw her, or who might have suspicions about who committed this crime. Do please call if you can help in any way. 01811 That's 01811 It's in the strictest confidence. And if you don't want to speak to a police officer, you can ask to talk to a BBC researcher, if you prefer. You can also phone the Murder Incident Room at Ballycastle. That's on 02657 
63711. That's 02657, the code for Ballycastle, 63711. Well, our next case is another murder investigation, I'm afraid. It's a vicious attack on a woman in Hertfordshire. It was her 81st birthday. Joan McCann was a well-known dog breeder, and she'd judged at many shows, including Crufts. What wasn't so well known about her was that she'd been something of a heroine for her remarkable undercover work during the Second World War. Using a false name, Marie Bucquet, she worked in occupied France and she was decorated for helping more than 80 Allied airmen to escape across enemy lines. Later, she settled in Hertfordshire, which is where our reconstruction begins. This is the National Trust's Ashridge estate. And beyond this monument, at the bottom of the lane, is Mrs McCann's cottage, Timspring. Her nearest neighbours were her housekeeper, Rita Green, who lives with her son, Dennis. It's eight o'clock on Thursday, the 5th of May. Britain is sticking to its policy of not making... There you are. Come along, out of the way. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. There. Lookies. Have your breakfast. Morning, Dennis. Morning, Mrs McCann. Shall I take the dogs out now, then? No, I think you'd better leave them a bit longer until I've gone. I'm just off to the hairdressers. You might feed the bigger dogs, sir. OK. Morning, Gemma. Morning, Miss McCann. That morning, Joan was at the hairdresser for her regular appointment. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. She'd been coming here every Thursday morning for 12 years. By two o'clock, she was back home to meet her old friend, Margaret Williamson. It's uh, such a pity, really, to do any inbreeding. It is, really. Margaret was also a dog breeder, and she wanted to talk about using one of Joan's dogs for breeding. Joan was renowned for her Labradors, and people from all over the country came to visit her. So any number of people could have had a good look at her house. Yes, oh dear. By a quarter to seven, Joan was getting ready to go to a meeting of the Kent, Sussex and Surrey Labrador Association. Well, I'm off now, darlings. Be good. She'd been made president 15 months ago. Bye-bye. Rita, her housekeeper, lives a hundred yards up the road. I'm off now, Rita. You won't forget to go down and turn on the lights for me and lock up, will you? No, no, I'll go down later. Goodbye. Bye. The meeting was being held at the Bell Inn at Godston in Surrey. It was a long way from Mrs McCann's home but she always made a special effort to attend the meetings in spite of the 60-mile drive. I agreed to a meeting on the 24th of March last. I'm pleased to be able to report to you that all our nominations for inclusion in the judges' list have been accepted by the council. And... I'm terribly sorry to be so late. The traffic was awful on the M25. It Good took to me about you, three hours to get here. Yes. Can I sit here? Yes. At about the same time, Rita was making her way down to the house to lock up for the night. Rita knew that Mrs McCann disliked coming back to a dark house, especially as it was so isolated. And she usually put the lights on to make the house look occupied before she locked up. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm now declared the meeting closed. It's 11 o'clock. Don't forget our next meeting here on June the 6th. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good Mrs McCann's friend, Brian Hayward, remembers she was a little anxious about the long journey home in the dark. You're welcome. Oh, would you follow me? Could I follow you back onto the M25, yes. please? Yes, that's, that's you fine. You know how yeah. tied up I yeah, get in that right. one-way system? Yes, that's good. No problem. Well, I'll see you in a month, then. Look forward to that, then, Joan. Goodbye, Brian. Bye-bye. As she followed him out of the car park, Brian, of course, couldn't have known that he would be the last person to see her alive.
A courting couple are crucial witnesses for what happened next. This is the lane leading to Mrs. McCann's cottage. Look what you want. The couple noticed a car drive up and down six or seven times. They didn't see what make of car it was, but they remember it was a four-door saloon. Later, the same couple saw an estate car drive down the track. That must have been Mrs. McCann arriving home. Mrs. McCann died before she even got into the house. Well, Richard Pottinger is in charge of the investigation. Why do you think she was killed? Very difficult to say. We know it's a very savage, senseless killing of a defenceless lady. The burglar had no reason to kill her whatsoever. He could have escaped from that house into the woods with no problems at all. Well, there were several suspicious cars seen in the lane by that couple. Uh, half an hour after the time she would have arrived home, the couple saw an estate car, rather like her own car, coming back down the lane. Could yeah. that have been her car? No, it was not her car uh, at all. We believe that it was a Bluebird estate car leaving about half past one. We still not have eliminated that vehicle, so we asked if that was owned by a courting couple for them to come forward. Right. And what about that saloon car then, the one that was seen going up and down several times? The saloon, court, saloon car, all we know is it's a four-door, dark-coloured saloon. We haven't traced those occupants, so we asked them to come forward as well. And we don't know the make or the colour of that for Not sure. at all. No. The stolen property, it seems to me, is going to be the key to solving this murder. That is correct. And there are three very distinctive bronze statues among the goods stolen. We'll start with that one. This is a copy of one of the ones that's stolen. Made it. This is cast iron. The one that was stolen was bronze. Yes, it's a bronze antique uh, pointer dog uh, with a, a rabbit. Uh, signed on the side with P.J. Menet, uh, valued about £2,500. This is a greyhound on the one stolen, solid brass, but on a small, uh, solid bronze on a smaller base with E. Freme on the base signed there. Right. The third one is so rare we can't get a copy of it, but we do have an artist's impression of what it looked like. Yes, Tell that, us about that. That is extremely rare. It's of a pointed dog with a rabbit on the base. The, the, it has become detached from the base, the one that has been stolen. Well, those are very distinctive. What else was stolen? A number of items were stolen, including a number of small uh, snuff boxes, which are quite uh, unusual, and a number of small ornaments. Right. So what is the most important part of your appeal tonight? My most important appeal is to all antique dealers, second-hand dealers. Should any of this property be offered to them, please contact us. But in the main, I'm asking members of the public, no doubt those who are watching tonight, there must be somebody out there who, who knows who's responsible for this particular vicious murder, either mother, father, friends, or whatever, I urgently ask them to come forward and contact us. All right, Mr. Potter, thank you very much indeed. You. And if you recognise or you think you know about either of those cars or you know the whereabouts of those bronze dog statues, this is the number to phone. It's 01 811 8055. Or you can phone the murder incident room direct on 0707 335500. That's 0707, the code for Welling Garden City, 335500.